Today is Thursday, June 29th, 2023, and you're listening to the Ask a Christian podcast. I'm your host, Nate. We meet a ninja Muslim today who um, we, we think is a Muslim, but says he's not. And the more we talk to him, it seems like he may be. Uh, I don't know why that matters to him. I don't know why he's not just like, yeah, bro, I'm a Muslim. Um, unless we're totally mistaken, you be the judge. I don't know. I like honest conversations with honest people. Uh, good faith actors are to be desired. And then we talk about someone's like, well, that's a stumbling block to certain people. Uh, talking about how Jesus is a stumbling block. Right? He is the uh, stone that the builders rejected and became the cornerstone. So, um, well, yeah, Jesus can be a stumbling block. Um, the implication was because of something someone found unsavory in the Bible. Talking about Jesus talks about, you know, by comparison, you must hate your mother and father and sister and brother to be his disciple. Uh, someone's like, well, they ask a question. Don't you see how that could be a stumbling block? Well, yes, we do. <laughs> um, which is explained in Matthew 10, by the way, how it says by comparison. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's plenty of stuff. The Pharisees had a stumbling block in Jesus over many things. So, um, yeah, that's biblically consistent. Jesus is a stumbling block to lots of people. Um, so repent, believe the gospel, be led by the Holy Spirit, and Jesus will be your Savior, not a stumbling block. So we talk about that and some more topics for a while. Enjoy this uh, broadcast, and please share these links with people. And uh, you can check out the Ask a Christian book on Amazon. You can check out the Ask a Christian store, grab a t-shirt, support this podcast. And you can also donate. The links are all in the podcast description to keep us going and fund this stuff. Um, equipment is old and not cheap to replace. Um, I, I do enjoy sharing the gospel with people, and I enjoy you know the other Christians that help along uh, that goal and that mission. So um, if you are a Christian, click the Clubhouse link that is also in the description. And uh, if you're a Bible-believing, God-fearing Christian, jump on Clubhouse and help us answer questions and field them from non-believers or other Christians who maybe don't know as much or are new in the faith and need uh, need some answers to commonly asked Christian questions. Um, if you can't do that or don't want to do that, uh, please click the links and financially help us out. Um, grab a t-shirt, too. You can do both, right? You can grab a t-shirt and also answer questions. <laughs> We also are trying to go in a new endeavor to use um, more, more individualized podcasts and talk more one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one with people uh, to, to drum up a little more interest instead of uh, 50 people all in these podcasts, all yelling and talking over people at the same time. We're trying to gear it towards a little more one-on-one -on -one conversations so you can go a little bit deeper. Um, I don't think that's going to replace this current rat's nest herding kittens together, uh, but that'll be in addition. So if you'd like to be a guest and have a little more subdued, dialed down, one-on-one -on -one conversation so you're not competing for airtime with everyone else, um, reach out to me. Ask a Christian club at gmail.com would be the best way, the email address. Um, so yeah, you can like, comment on YouTube or Rumble or BitChute or anywhere else. And that is all today. Enjoy the show. To that many of these instances, probably about it's always the, the same kind of ones, maybe about 10 I've seen so far. Um, there might be more, there might be less. But like what, like what do you make of them kind of arguments and them kind of points? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, so like your, um, yeah, your question, if, if you could like, you know, find something, like you said, um, you know, the, in one place in the Bible, it says like 22 years, and another it talks about like, you know, 40 or, or something like that. I'd say um, that would be proof the Bible is wrong, and I would stop being a Christian. Ha, just kidding. I know you're talking about like Jerobo or whatever the guy's name is, the king. So I mean, you know, mo some people will say um, there there is absolutely no error. And through like through however they do it, I don't. It's not really my dog in the fight. But they'll do they'll like do some math and be like, well, look, because of this, then this. So in the in the King James Bible, I believe is the only one that it was it was has this problem. But people will say, well, based on this and this and this, which I don't recall at the moment, um, there is no error and it's completely fine. But I'm also fine with uh, you know people will say, well, it was an it was whenever they were making copies of copies there was some scribe who mo put a notation and it was like a scribal error. So someone put like something in the, in the notes section, basically saying, uh, asking a question or is this right? Or they, they used um, like a different letter or anyways, it was a scribal error and that got included in the copy of the King James, like the 1611 King James. And it just remains there to this day, even though um, everyone knows this. And they had the integrity to leave it as written, but they'll like make notes saying this is what happened, but we're going to leave the integrity of it there. And I think like New King James may have corrected that and all the other modern translations like don't have that in there. So anyways, that's what I'd say. The, the positions Christians take on that, 
is either no, it's completely fine. There is no error because of whatever reasons I'm sure you've heard before. Um, or the worst case scenario, it was a scribal error and uh, a guy, you know, a scribe made a mistake that got included when it shouldn't have been. And that's why there's a discrepancy of like 20 years. Um, yeah. So those are the two directions people go with that. That's what you're talking about, right? It's between, is it, is it Kings and, um, well, you tell me, you said you heard it like 10 times. It's like the one in like first Kings and some other place. Yeah. I believe you got the nail on the head. Yeah. So, I mean, th so those are the two, two places and I'm fine with either, right? Like, you know, whenever Christians talk about, you know, we believe the Bible's, you know, the inspired word of God and all this other stuff, we're talking about the original autographs. So like, undoubtedly, there've probably been copies of, you know, the Quran, peace be upon it, copies of the uh, different Bibles that no one has ever heard about because they just don't exist anymore. Um, copies of copies of copies of all kinds of stuff that have inaccuracies in them. Um, that's just human error. But as far as the copies of the Bible that we have today, that's like widely, you know, that everyone knows about, just like the Quran, right? Like, you know, there's a time when they wanted to unify the Quran and they get all their ducks in a row. So now they would say, well, the Quran is the way it always should have been. And we would say, well, the Bible is the way it always has been and always should be. So, yeah. I don't think that's a fair comparison, mate. Well, to be compare, fair, I, I compared it to like, pretty much every literary work ever that's had a copy made of it. No, the, the, the Quran has an ex excellence to it, uh, more than the Bible, I'm sorry to say. Well, could you um could you talk a little bit about the, um if you're familiar with the history of the Quran, peace be upon it, about the, was it, whatever century it was, because I know it came like 600 years after the Bible, the New Testament, but there was some kind of war, and you can fill in the blanks, I'm a little hazy, I just know enough to ask the question. So there were different versions of the Quran, peace be upon it, and there was a king, and it was during a time of war, and this king wanted to have a unified Quran that all, you know, said the same exact thing, so he rounded up all the copies of the Quran that were not the same, and he burned them all, um, so then they only had the one copy of the Quran, um, why it's unified. Um, so can you can you talk a little bit about that for for people that don't know the full history of it? So it started off... <laughs> At the time of Abu Bakr, the first caliph after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, three years after the death. And he went and he compiled the Quran, which was already written at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now he uh, missioned uh, uh, his companions to do so. Mm -hmm. Well, sure. Uh, Michael, I see that you're done. I, I hate to have no, you no, I'm, talk too uh, much. Uh, I'm oh, oh, you're still talking? My, yeah, my, my bad. Uh, I want to mute by accident. Uh, what oh. part did I leave off at? Um, someone typed the very last word he said. It, you, you, the last concept I heard was you were talking about the, uh, the guy, oh gosh, another word for king or sultan or ruler. Um, oh yeah, Caliph. So I was, I was yeah, Caliph. About Abu Bakr, how he compiled the Quran. Now, um, he compiled the Quran, and the people who came to uh, with the compilations of the Quran written, uh, they had to bring a witness with them to prove that they, you know, that this Quran was written uh, in the pres uh, presence of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And this is the first Quran compiled. Now, this Quran ended up making its way to the th uh, third khali uh, Caliph, uh, Caliph Uthman. Now what Uthman done was he kind of gave a skeletal, um, a, a basis for the Quran so that he can send it to, you know, the different regions uh, where Islam has spread to. Because at the time of uh, Uthman, Islam had already spread to, you know, Yemen, Persia, etc. and etc. Yeah, and so... Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't have any response and, other than, you yeah. know, if, well, well, you're going to, going to sun. I mean, you know, I, I guess I don't have any response other than to say, you know, everyone has their way of explaining, you know, everything. It's just what is true yeah. and, you know, uh, so what is true. But, uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, secular scholars that over the past 10 years, uh, they've put the Quran, the Quran and the historicity of the Quran to request test. I can send you some articles. Oh, that's probably okay. But no, I mean, <laughs> secular scholars. I, I would want to see which secular scholars. Um, no, if it's I, far I, 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 I it's only... Well, well, hang on. Hang on. Uh, okay, yeah. 
But if it's secular scholars, I wonder if Bart Ehrman's in that list, because um, the only time he tries to be nice to Muslims is when he's picking a bone with Christians. Um, so that would be fun to see. But, you know, just like Christians will say, you know, they'll say, how do you know, like to Sun Tzu's question, how is the word preserved? How is the Bible preserved? And like, well, there's eyewitness testimony ever since then. And there were so many copies that it's not just like they took the one and only copy and somehow corrupted it or messed it up. Yeah, it's like the, even from the time of, well, hang on. The that's, why you're t- that's the hang problem. On. I don't know why you're talking over me, so don't do that. I let you talk, even though it hurt my ears. So, you know, don't interrupt the mods. That's pretty good advice. Um, but there are, you know, copies of copies. Like, Paul sent out lots of letters, so even when he wrote them, there were many copies uh, being made. So to say it was somehow corrupted, you would have had to round up all of those copies, corrupt all of them, or destroy them all, or whatever, and then write something new. So, you know, that's what I would say. And then someone can take that or leave that. Um Amos, do you have anything to say? Well, Michael, I see that you're done with your phone call. I hate to talk too much, otherwise we're not going to have we're going to run out of stuff to talk to you later. <laughs> well, no, this is well, yeah, hey, uh, hey everybody. Um, yeah, so this is actually something um, my my dear friend uh, Josh, who's in the chat but I guess can't actually talk right now, had popped a question in actually. Oh, about um, numbers. I, I remember yeah, saying yeah. That earlier. Yeah, so it says, uh, apparently yesterday you mentioned, or uh, um, a question mentioned numbers 3118 yesterday. Um, and his question is, if you, be, if you became convinced that that phrase translated young girls actually did not refer to young female humans, how would that change your understanding of that passage? Oh, hang on, I was trying to, I was trying to find it in chat and only half to, okay, so numbers 3118. Yesterday, if you became convinced that the phrase translated young girls actually did refer to very young human females. Oh, I mean, it wouldn't change my understanding of the passage, but I didn't give my full understanding of the passage yesterday. So, uh, like, take, like, whatever it says, like, take the young girls for yourselves. Like, um, this is where I'll say, call a rabbi. It's not passing the buck. It's not shifting the blame. It's for a proper understanding. And, you know, I, I do that with confidence because, you know, in over a decade of doing these discussions, believe me, this topic has come up. So if you trust my word at all, I am telling you, um, you know, a Jewish rabbi will give you the answer. I will now parrot, um, paraphrasingly parrot. Um, and that would be in no way, shape or form is this talking about sex. This is talking about take them back and basically the, the, they will be your captives, right? Because you're not just going to let them go. So you'll t- keep them for a certain amount of time. And then you'll say, OK, do you want to convert to Judaism? Right. Because believe it or not, sex was not the top of everyone's mind. It was religion. It was religion before God. So they'd first say, you know, do you want to convert? Do you want to do this? And if they said yes, then they they basically go free and stuff like that. I mean, you know, they they live among them because everyone else they know is dead from war. But it's like, okay, now you're like no one's no one's captive, no one's property. And if they say no, there's something else like they become like a household maid or something like that. So the idea that people are just like, you know, raping, pillaging marauders um, besides being forbidden. Like, you know, all, all the stuff, you know, we talk about all the stuff in Deuteronomy and rape and all this other stuff um, when it suits us. But then when it comes and like, you know, how you, oh, you rape laws this and rape laws that. And we explain that. And then when it comes to numbers, it's just like, no, you can totally be pedo rapist. And that's totally fine. Um, God has opened the earth and swallowed like hundreds of thousands of people for less than that. Um, so anyways, that, that's the answer you'll get from like an Orthodox rabbi. Um, or the Talmud, you could you, you know you could probably consult one online. Um, yeah, I can, <laughs> good I, morning, I can give Nate. you a resource. But yeah, hey, I'll be, uh, just to finish. So yeah, this is in no way should perform talking about sex. It's one hundred percent, you know, talking about just keep them with you. And if you want to talk about marriage, I, they have their answer for that. So I I don't actually know at what age, um, you know, in Orthodox Judaism, if there is one that like marriage becomes cool. Maybe it's younger than you know you would prefer. Um, I actually don't know what that age is, but to say it's like, you know, a bunch of like prepubescent teen, uh, prepubescent girls just getting like, you know, raped and pillaged and marauded and murdered and sex slaves and all this other stuff. Um, no, they would be like, God will smite you with fire from heaven for less than that. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it is, yeah so, it is really interesting. So, so the Sorry, answer, the yeah, the answer is also, my, hey, Michael. I, yeah, I just want to keep my train of thought because I'm not that smart and I'll lose it. Um, so... Uh, because it's interesting because passages like this, like, uh, and I don't have a, a Bible close to me, um, and I'm paying more attention to this than, than an app on my phone right now, or a, a Bible app. 
but but there's parts of the Bible where it, where it says, you know, it's like, you know, you, you know, you take the, you know, like basically, and it may have even be this passage, but, you know, where you basically you go in and you, you know, you take the Lord, you know, take the land that the Lord has given you. And, you know, you, uh, you the Bible talks about, you know, basically you, you know, kill uh, all the men and then you take the women and you allow the women to mourn and they have to, you know, uh, shave their head and pare their nails and stuff like that. And they have to mourn uh, or, or no, it may not be the husband, it was the families. I'm, I'm misspeaking. Um, so, you know, I, like after they've mourned their parents for a month, then you can have, then you can take them as your wife, right? There's no, there's no talk about there of consent at all. And so it, and I understand that that's somewhat of a parallel issue, but if we're talking about a girl who's living with her, with her family, with her parents, I don't think it's a gigantic leap to assume that these are younger, if not very, and I'm, I'm not saying, oh, they were doing it to 10 year olds. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, I'm saying we probably don't know the actual age. I think in that way, you and I are in agreement with that, that we don't know the actual age, but they're probably not adults either. Um, and so th that those are things that are problematic for me. I don't know the language, you know, like, like my friend Josh does and, and other people that are, you know, uh, like, you know, Kip Davis, who actually speaks these, you know, speaks and understands these languages and is experts in these fields. Um, but these are issues that give, um, give other people problems as well. But I think you're probably right. And this would be a good time, like if Abba was here, right? Uh, you know, our friend Abba to, to chime in on that and give us a, a Jewish perspective for sure. Anyway, sorry, sorry to cut you off there. I'll be go. Yeah, no problem. So you'll find the answer in De Deuteronomy 21, 10 to 14. Now, a lot of people find it as a problem. But that's because you don't believe in God. If you truly believed in God and knew what these other nations were about and saw what they were doing generation after generation, the sins are listed in Leviticus chapter 18, right? God tolerated those sins for 400 years, 400 years. Now, the age of uh, consent for the Bible, at least the New Testament, is past the age of, uh, of you know, p past the age of, uh, you know, your flower of youth. Menstruation is what you're thinking. Right. Past the age of menstruation, not during, but past the age of menstruation. And also your father's uh, consent. And that's 1 Corinthians 7, 36 to 38. As far as the Bible goes, the way the Bible describes <clears throat> is simply this. Every time the Bible describes a woman, right, of marriageable age, it always describes her fully mature, right? Like if you look at Ezekiel 16, 4 to 14, I don't have the Bible in front of me, so I can't pull up the verses, but nevertheless, though. <clears throat> so people find these uh, to be problematic simply because they're not understanding the totality of what the Bible teaches and um what the uh, nations that were being slaughtered, what they were doing generation after generation, which God would not tolerate in their midst. Yeah, what's interesting, the only thing that I, the only thing that I would comment on, and I know, oh, crap, you, I, on mute. I, I, know I know you didn't mean it in the way it, it kind of came across, but I don't, I don't find these things problematic because I don't believe in God. These are things I started finding problematic when I still believed. Right. Um, so so it, it might be a little minimizing to say, oh, well, it's just because you don't believe in God. That's all. And, but I don't well, think you necessarily meant it that way. Yeah. Well, yeah. What, what you well, find hey, problematic on, I, 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 is because, sorry. because, I, 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 because hang on, let me, let me, let me, yeah, let, let me jump in real fast. The, the bigger overarching point is see, this is where it is unfortunate. If someone didn't do what I just did, which is, you know, consult, uh, you know, consult the Kiddushan. So it's the. In the Talmud, it is the Tractate Kiddushin that discusses. So if someone didn't do this, and some other Christian's like, well, I don't know, the Bible says it, maybe God likes rape, I don't know. Then people are pronouncing judgment um, on this amoral God and telling how they could never serve him because he's evil if he existed. And that would be unfortunate, because that's just not true. So I would encourage everyone in every discussion that, you know, like you said, Michael, I don't know is a perfectly fine answer. Um, or in cases we do know, which I'll read in a second. Um, I mean, that's better. If you know something, you know it. Um, but also the third thing I'd like to add to I don't know is a perfectly fine answer is without fully informed knowledge, withhold judgment. 
So if you're if you're not 100 percent positive on something, perhaps holding judgment, because if you if you like start to form a path uh, based on ill conceived or missing information, then that could be to your own your own detriment. Um, so anyways, for example, the um, yeah, the, the ultimate answer is women always have a choice. Even thousands of years ago, um, you think, wow, it's almost like a god is somehow behind this. Sure, people can, you know, project things they wish he would have done better, maybe, from a secular humanist standpoint. But when, you know, literally marauding, raping, and pillaging was the culture of the day, um, they still had an elevated sense of morality. Um, so uh, as the part about the Bible that it does say that we already read is, so this is from the tract Kudoshin in the Talmud. Um and part of this is what we just read. This uh, gives her time to mourn her family, providing her with clothing, allowing her to convert to Judaism if she wishes. That wasn't in there. Um, and giving her the opportunity to annul the marriage if she desires to. So they're like, I'm going to make you my wife. I don't want to be your wife. I now pronounce you husband and wife. I want an annulment. Ah. So, I mean, it would probably go a little less, less dramatic than that. But on one hand, you can you can think, like, put yourself back there. Like, Albie, Michael, imagine yourselves as um, Gentile women. <laughs> Back in the day, um, you know, your tribe who has just sworn death on the Israelites has been conquered by the Israelites, and they've all been wiped out. So it's just you, little old Gentile woman, Michael and Albie. <laughs> and, um, you know, these people are, like, taking you captive and taking you back to their Israelite camps. And they say, okay, um, you're, you know, 25-year-old, you know, unmarried, whatever, woman who's never known a man. Would you like to be my husband? Um, on one hand, you would think, well, everyone I know and love is dead, so um, what am I going to do? Say no, be turned loose, and go get eaten by wild animals in the wilderness. Um, maybe I'll do that, because I hate you so much. Or the other one is, well, I still can have some sort of life. These people are going to treat me, you know, it seems like their camp is okay. They treat people relatively equally. So, sure, what about, sure, I'll go ahead and get married. So, and that's kind of what you're faced with. Um, it's not exactly chained up in a sex dungeon. So, if that makes it a little more palatable, uh, I would like to get Michael or Albi or Michael or Alby to respond to that real quick. So, um, yeah, if anyone wants to read more of this, track down the Kudishan tractate in the Talmud, and, and that's why I always refer to that right because you can't you you can't follow the is the Israelite law in the Bible as if we know anything without going through the proper channels of interpreting it, which is the Talmud. Uh, Michael, you were unmuted for a second. Yeah, and I and I don't know again. Uh, you know, as, as, as my dear friend Josh would say, this is not my area of expertise. Um, so I would defer to people who actually know the language, understand the history. And that's why I'd said, you know, they would be good if somebody like Abba was here, right, to give us the Jewish perspective. Um, but, but more than that, I would say, um, Albi, you, you were kind of starting to say something and then, and then didn't. Oh, yeah, sorry, Albi. So I, you, I, so I you, cut you off, Albi. Uh, now he's, he's not speaking in protest. He's like, the hell with you guys, man. Oh, it's like Chris. I made him mad yesterday. Well, Albie, if you're speaking, just let us know. Uh, Sun Tzu, you want to say something? Yeah, um, so basically, I've got a, a couple of verses that I just wanted some, uh, I guess, some clarity on. It's not really a question that I've got, but it's, to me, on the outside, as an objective uh, kind of viewer of all kind of religions and such and such, I just find it on... Um, I find problematic verses within every, uh, within a lot of faiths, let's just say. And this is one of them. Uh, so in, um, this, I think it's the second book of Samuel 16, uh, verse 21. It says, uh, I'm squinting. Absalom, or is it Absalom? Uh, Absalom, yeah. Sets up a, yeah. He sets up a tent on the first, uh, is it, uh, it's, I'm reading a screenshot. It says, uh, I can't remember, I see that word. He sets up a tent anyway on the flat roof and lays ten of his father's wives and rapes them all one by one in the sight of the whole of Israel. Now, um, I, I'm led to believe that this uh, Absalom, or whatever he said his name is, is a son of David, right? Yeah. So, yeah, and David is a prophet and the son of God, right? And king, David's a king. Yeah, David's a king also. So the, so basically, the son of a the son of a prophet raped ten of his wives in a row. Um, I don't know. It seems kind of uh, problematic. You know, it seems kind of. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really shocking and gory, right? 
so uh, like what would be so, the like, explanation behind that or like what's the lesson to be learned well first of all i don't i don't i don't think uh, many want, many people would consider david a prophet um they consider him king so because he was a king so um, king david and yeah absolutely like if you read it like the bible's full of all kinds of of horrible terrible shocking stuff um that's just telling history so yeah when absalom did this the what did you say the moral of the story the moral of the story is this is an evil guy. He ends up getting what's coming to him and don't rape people. That's the moral of the story. Like he did a terrible thing and he ends up meeting his end eventually because of it. Yeah. So sorry. I was away from my phone. Um, I'm actually uh, fishing right now. So I'm okay. going to be off and on, but I am, uh, I'm listening, but just out of curiosity, uh, since who's a, are you, uh, are you a Muslim? Who's Tracy Hormuz? I don't know. Tracy Homer. Is that like a euphemism? Or... <laughs> oh, you've got jokes. All right, well, type them in chat. Um, yeah, Albie, what were you saying? Is he a Muslim? Is Sun Tzu? Oh. I'm not, not, I'm not a Muslim. No, what's your worldview? I'm trying to find my place in the world. No, it's like a, it's really confusing. There's, uh, you know, I find that people. Yeah, no, no, no problem. Let me show you some stuff about the Quran. Number one, uh, <clears throat> about the Bible. Unlike the Quran, the Bible, God doesn't cover up the sins of his uh, of his prophets, of his kings, of his sons. He doesn't cover their them up. Unlike uh, Allah who's always after uh, the sins of Muhammad, has to clean up after him. Matter of fact, we have to actually clean up after Allah uh, in itself. In chapter 33, verse 49, I'm going to tell you something. Yeah, L let me tell you something about uh, the Quran and Allah. You ready? And about Muhammad. Wait. But why are you talking about that for? I thought this is a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure, uh, Albi, I'm pretty sure he said he wasn't a Muslim. Yeah, that's um, okay. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty Albie's sure. Muslim, I wasn't born yesterday, and he is a Muslim. I'm just going by what people tell me, man. Like, I mean, if yeah, it doesn't not, matter what they tell you. Exactly. Yeah, he is Michael. He is a Muslim. So now let me tell let me tell him a little bit about Allah. Yeah. Right. In chapter 33, verse 49 of the of the Quran, it's for those women that have not been touched, um, have not been touched sexually by their husbands there is no waiting period so the husband can let her let her let her go pay her a generous amount and let her go the reason why because there wasn't any sexual intercourse however according to chapter 66 verse uh i'm sorry chapter 65 verse 4 of the quran chapter 65 verse 4 of the quran those who have passed the menstrual age and those who have not reached the menstrual age there's there's an ida there's a three-month waiting period so why would there be a three-month waiting period for the girls that have not reached menstruation they're prepubescent why would there be a three-month waiting period so there's a waiting period no yeah so wh why is there a waiting period because there's a waiting period before everybody, uh, yeah, before you can marry. Not before As you get married. No, before divorce. The, the passages is about oh, divorce. Yeah, sir, 65 four is about divorce. Uh, hey, Albie, God bless, brother. And sir, 3349 that Albie... That Albi was referring to, uh, we refer to it as no hitta, no itta, which means if there's no consummation of the marriage, then there's no itta for the woman because the waiting period is to find out if she's pregnant or not. That's what the itta is for. So when the prepubescent girl receives an itta in the other verse, that means that there was consummation and they have to wait to see if the girl is pregnant. Well, in the, a waiting period, it, it, it's not prerequisite that the, the, the marriage has to be consummated for there to be a waiting period. A waiting period is just a waiting period. It's a self-explanatory part. In, in your own words, you said you weren't a Muslim? Right. <laughs> in Surah 3349, though, in Surah 3349, though, Stun, um, it says specifically, it says specifically in that verse 
that if the girl does not consummate the marriage with her husband, then there is no idda. So why is there no idda if there's no consummation? Brother, if you're not Muslim, don't answer these questions. You say you're just trying to find your place. Well, hang on, hang on. There's a couple of things. Wait, there's a couple of things here. This is really getting convoluted. But no, no, uh, me. And I wanted to see what you had to say, too. But um, the thing I was pointing out is he says he's not a Muslim, but then is basically taking up a very deep apologetics for Islam as if maybe he wasn't being completely honest or if he was a Muslim and now has denied Muhammad, which maybe he will in a second. Um, so one of those things, right? So like if he's not a Muslim, he sure knows a lot about it. <laughs> that was my point. Yeah. And that's super troubling, man. Like, I mean, like, I mean, I at least have, like and I, I say this to, to believers of all different faith traditions all the time, like have the courage of your convictions. If you come in here, like everybody knows and I'll tell them freely, like the, I believe the Christian God is just made up mythology. But I mean, have like if you come in and you say, oh, somebody says, are you Muslim? And you say no, like that, like, yeah, yeah, at, at least be on, at least be honest, man. Like at least be have the courage of your yeah, conviction. If you let me, if you let me speak, I don't mind. Uh, Nate, if he said that I t I'm taking a deeply apologetic uh, stand. All I believe all I said was a waiting period is a waiting period. That's it. And in response to uh, whether you said I'm a, a Muslim or not, or I'm denying my faith. I don't believe I lied. I never uttered one single word of uh, untruth since I've been in here. And uh, to be honest, I take it as a personal slight that uh, you would accuse me of doing such a thing. Well, no, I, I take it as a slight when people don't understand what I'm saying. No, no. I don't know why we're, we're still giving time to this. I, I really want to get to me in a second and see what she said, but no. So the dichotomy here is, look, I'm not saying you're lying. I'm giving you a chance to say you're not lying. So if, for example... You say, you know, you're taking this kind of apologetics approach, so if someone's not a Muslim, like if someone asked me about that, about Islam, and said, hey, what do you think about this? I'm like, sure, I don't have anything to say, I'm not Muslim, I don't really, I'm not familiar with the Quran, I've read it a little bit, but I don't, I don't remember it, so I don't have an opinion on that. So, if someone's like, oh, what do you think about this in the Quran, and they start, they start pushing back and refuting it, that means they somehow know about this, so either they, they are a Muslim, or maybe they used to be a Muslim, or maybe they grew up in a Muslim household, so they would know some of the stuff in order to say, no, you're incorrect, let me push back on it. So the very fact that you're, you're kind of doing that, you're pushing back on it and, and debating this, it makes me think either you are a Muslim, which, you know, is practicing Takio, which is being deceptive, which is fine in Islam, I guess, because um, that, that's okay to deceive people for the greater good. Or if you're an ex-Muslim and you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm an atheist now because, you know, Islam is false, but I know about this topic because I was raised around it. Either of those is fine. So I was giving you the opportunity to say, you know, either one of those things, like you're a Muslim practicing Takia for Allah, praise be upon him, or you're an ex-Muslim or something, and you're, you're just familiar with this verse for some other reason. That's all. Yeah, like I said, yeah, uh, when I'll be, okay, when I'll be uh, refused to uh, believe what I said, even though I've iterated and reiterated many times, I haven't told one single word of untruth since I've been here. So I'll okay, be well, this kind of, uh, one second, well, second, I'll be kind of barraging some sort of verses at me. Like, well, okay, uh, so then, I mean, it, well, if you're, okay, so, like, let's take your word, then. This is easy. Like, if, if you're not a, you know, if you're not a Muslim, like you're saying, you're not lying, I mean, can you just do something like, you know, say Muhammad is, you know, not a prophet, or he's not the prophet, or, I don't know, something something denying Muhammad, and then we can just be like, well, okay, if you're a Muslim, you just did something bad, and let's move on, or, well, guess he's really not a Muslim. So someone's like, hey, Nate, prove you're not a Christian. Go ahead and deny Christ. They're like, oh, I'm not going to do that. And they're like, ha, see, you're a Christian. I'm like, yep, I am a Christian. Yes, so. In regards to that, I'm, I'm, you're trying to like pigeonhole me into one uh, thing. The thing is, I wouldn't say, uh, I wouldn't really deny anything because I'm not in a position of knowledge to deny uh, whether uh, Muhammad was a. Well, you could say you believe. Like, you know, Michael will say, well, Michael, what's your take on uh, the Prophet Muhammad? Oh, I think um, from, from what I've read, the little bit that I've read, he was uh, an illiterate epileptic um, and he totally didn't ride to heaven on a winged horse because that's not a thing. And so you would say, even though you're, you know, you're an atheist, um, and you would say you could be wrong, and Muhammad could, in fact, be a true prophet. You just don't believe it, right? So I, oh, I understand yeah, some yeah, things. Yeah, sorry, uh, I could clarify that. I could be well, wrong. I could. So be. I understand. Uh, yeah, Sun Tzu, if you if you're like you know walking the line where you know you you don't you're not in a position to pass judgment because you know he he could be everything that people claim he is. But would you say mm -hmm. that it's your belief that he is everything that that Muslims say, or it's your belief that 
no, he is not all these things Muslims say. I mean, I think I don't think that Muslims. Uh, I, I think if you ask them, they've got a lot of disagreements as well. So I don't think they necessarily. Uh, is Muhammad I mean, the prophet have... that got the got the Quran from the angel? Can we just do that one? Well, do you believe? Do you be, do you believe that he got the word of the I angel? That's what Muslims do believe that, yeah, for sure. If you so you believe them, that? Me, if, you ask, if you're asking me about my personal beliefs. Then yes, that's what I'm doing. To, I'm not in a position to deny it because I can't disprove it. Okay, so I think the evasiveness is answering. Um, me, I, yeah, you've been up here for a little while. And sorry, Albie and Chris, I didn't mean to cut you guys off. I just, you know, I only have so much bandwidth, but let's let's bring you back in right after me. What's up, me? Did you have a question or do you want to talk about any of this stuff? Um, no, I just didn't understand. And hello to everyone. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning, whatever part of the world you're in. Um, no, I just didn't understand why the brothers were, um, coming at him about Muslim when he clearly stated that he wasn't Muslim. I mean, it sounds well, like I he think that's been cleared up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it sounds like he's knowledgeable of it, but the brother said that he's just trying to find his place in the world, so... I mean, that doesn't mean that he may not be knowledgeable about certain religions, but he denied that he wasn't. He denied that he was. Uh, he wasn't Muslim. So I didn't understand why the brothers. Did you have? Did, did you have any other topic or question? No, no, no. I just came in, so I, I'm just listening for now. Okay, uh, Constantine. Good morning. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, just wanted to uh, read a verse from the Bible and ask how you feel about it. Um, so it's uh, Luke fourteen twenty six. Jesus says, "If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple." Uh, please, uh, just can you explain, you know, how you feel about that verse? Sure. Yeah, I'll be Chris, I cut you guys off. Who wants? Uh, yeah, Chris, go ahead. Yeah, the way that I would say it is that you must give all your love to God first and love him with all your uh, heart, body, and soul, um, and not yourself or your family above God. God's above everything, and that's what he's reassuring us there. Yeah, that's exactly right, Chris. The parallel verse to that, it's Matthew ten thirty-seven, right? So, in other words, it's called uh, love by preference. So make your love to Jesus look as if you hate everyone else in the world. Not that you are to hate everyone else in the world, but the type of love that you offer to God is incomparable. Can I offer something here, Nate? Because I, I hear this a lot personally. Like People take one verse out of the Bible, and I'll, I'll just kind of make one comparison, right? Like if you wanted to learn calculus, let's say, for example, or any other subject, would you literally take, read a single paragraph or a sentence out of that book and then have an immediate issue with the entirety of calculus? Do you think you're getting a full understanding uh, of the subject matter by taking individual things out of any, any book whatsoever? Well, I mean, this this seems to be a recurring theme in Jesus' teaching, right? So he says, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, and uh, divide, you know, father and mother, wife and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, spouse and stuff like that. So, I mean, he seems to be, I mean, I, I agree with you guys that he is saying that, you know, the kingdom of God is more important than anything in life. He's using pretty strong language, you know, hate mother and father, you know, brothers and sisters and wife and children and your own life. I mean, I understand it's, you know, hyperbole, but I don't think any of you would put it that way. I mean, no, that's, that's pretty hyperbole. strong language. It's not hyperbole. It's Deuteronomy 13. If you read from five and on, right? If anyone entices you to go after any other God but the true God, then you bring them out to the, uh, in the middle of the, you know, congregation, and you stone them to death. That's exactly it. So it's not hyperbole. And I, like I told you, the parallel verse to that's Matthew ten thirty seven. So if you're looking for an answer, read Matthew ten thirty seven. Yeah, uh, and for I the mean, record, that's mind, a strong language. <laughs> yeah, uh, sorry. Do you mind if I read Matthew ten thirty seven to actually unpack what I'll be saying? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's saying, uh, "He who loves father or mother more than me 
is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. We can't deny the fact that this may be a stumbling block, though, for it using such a strong language as hate. Um, well, well yeah, you know what? That's a great, <clears throat> well, me, that's a great point. And I would say a stumbling block is, uh, son, I got I to mute you when you're when you're not speaking. It's a lot of feedback. Um, but I would say that that's a great point, and I may have in the past tried to get around the stumbling block, but I think that's exactly what it is, because scripturally, Albie, I, I think you'll probably know this, um, where it is. But, you know, when it talks about Jesus as the cornerstone, uh, you know, the stumbling block that's become the cornerstone. And he talks about the stone that the builders rejected. And it talks literally, it talks about Christ being a stumbling stone, a stumbling block to people, to these Pharisees that, you know, have people other than Jesus as the Messiah and have other interests than that. So I would say this can absolutely be a stumbling block. And that's why, you know, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. Um, so I think, you know, his sheep i mean you know we're it's not super fun to be called the sheep they're kind of dumb but you know the christians we get it and, and we just know that um you know what albie and chris and and Ezek and the other people are talking about like we just believe this is the right answer and this is the right reading so if someone else is like well this sounds, sounds so bad and that sets them on a trajectory towards you know denying or refuting or hating this god or hating the idea of this concept of this god then for whatever reason it is supposed to be a stumbling block, just like the disciples asked Jesus, uh, you know, where um, why he talks in riddles, why he talks in parables. And Jesus answers and says, look, for some people, they're supposed to get this message. They're supposed to know it. For other people, it's God's purpose that he hides it from them. So whenever people say, why doesn't Jesus just speak plainly? Why doesn't Jesus just, you know, come out and say all these things a hundred times where no one can mistake it? Because according to Jesus' own words, some people are intentionally not supposed to understand it. Um, and, you know, that's unfortunate. But I would say it's fortunate that, you know, whoever wants to understand it can repent, can believe the gospel, exercise faith in Christ. And like magic or God, um, they're going to be transformed and they're going to see this Bible with like new lenses or new eyeballs. And they're going to start thinking a lot of the stuff that was like hard, a hard saying before and a hard thing to hear. Um, all of a sudden just starts making sense. They're like, huh, I guess God isn't so bad. Have I brainwashed myself or is the Bible true that I have a new heart and I've been changed and God himself, um, you know, is guiding me through this. Um, so you're, I totally agree. You're right. Me. It is absolutely a stumbling block. Um, but that's just consistent with what, you know, the rest of the Bible says. Albie, are you familiar with that? Ver I mean, I know you're familiar with it. Do you know where that is immediately? The cornerstone or the stumbling block, the stone the builders rejected has become the yeah, cornerstone. I'm driving, but it's in, I know it's Matthew 21 verse 42, along with Psalm 118, 22. And I can give you all the Old Testament passages like uh, Isaiah 8, uh, 13 to 15, and uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, 5 through uh, 8 as well. Ah, well, thank you. And let's not forget that it's also the fifth commandment. So, again, everything in context, read the entirety of the book that says literally to honor your mother and father as a commandment. So contextually there should be no issue with this because it, it's it's driving home a point right and you're focusing on like the, the the words that are being used you're seeing you're not seeing the the force for the trees kind of a thing here well i i think i think if i you know my interpretation of jesus is he is saying i mean sure love your father and mother but if in any way they prevent you from loving God, you know, the, following the first four commandments, which are the most important, then, you know, you need to hate them. You know, he is literally saying, you know, if, if there is a, you know, if, if there, you know, if, if you have a choice between following God and loving your mother and father, you know, children and the wife and brothers and sisters and your own life, then you choose God. I mean, and I mean, to me, this this seems like very like radical cultish language. I mean, that's what cult leaders. You well, know, if you believe in this faith, though, Constantine, think about this for a second, though. If you believe in faith and you don't follow Christ, what happens to you in our faith? I mean, you go I, to I'm eternal atheist, damnation, I'm, I'm, right? I'm, I'm a former Christian, but yeah, right, well, sure, sure. Yeah, right. So that's a big deal. Okay, it's very serious, and it's a horrible thing, right? It's absolute. It's it's by far the worst thing that you could possibly that could possibly befall upon a human being in our in our religion, essentially, right? Worse than worse than murder, worse than rape. It, it's the worst possible thing, right? So when he says hate, yes, it's a strong word because look at the consequence of these actions, right? 
that's the severity that God is in the context that God is like trying to provide here. So if you believe and you re and it's real to you, yes, hate them for that because they're damning you for eternity. Sure. Hopefully that makes some, some sort of sense. Yeah, I mean, I understand uh, Jesus has like an apocalyptic understanding of the world that, you know, there's a, you know, there's a kind of a stark contrast between the kingdom of God and kind of the kingdom of this earth. And uh, you should choose the kingdom of God. I, you know, I understand the problem is that every single cult leader in the world uses the same, you know, basic contrast that, you know, follow me, you know, accept our teachings, don't question, you know, and if you need to, you know, hate your family for it, do it because what we're doing here is the most important thing. And uh, I mean, I, I just, I just find that just from a humanistic level, you know, very dangerous uh, sort of teaching. I understand you like agree with Jesus, so you accept that it's, you know, he is. So you, he is you right think, that do you think Christianity point. does not want people to ask questions about the faith? Yeah, I was. You, just, you think that that's that's ignorant, bro? Yeah, I'm sorry. Like, again, you, you haven't read the the context of the entire book, right? You're you're taking out snippets and trying to leverage them for the your own argument's sake, but. You know, have you ever heard of Doubting Thomas, for example? <laughs> the guy who's like, show me your wound. I don't believe it with my own eye. Talking to Jesus Christ himself, right? So for to assume that this is somehow like correlative to a cult, right? That, oh, you can't, you're not allowed to ask questions. You're not allowed to be creative. You're not allowed to question uh, God at all in any manner whatsoever as a human being, you know, is it, silliness. It's just an absolutely not. And, and Fury, this is why I jumped in. Nate. This, this, this is this is why Nate. We we have to be very careful about certain people when they say certain things. When he's trying to compare that to some type of uh, evil propaganda, uh, Fury said it best. It seems like like the Bible is the only book or letter of antiquity that people refuse to read in its entirety. Like any other situation, they won't do that. And 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 you have to apply things contextually and apply the proper hermeneutics when you're trying to understand, especially dealing with letters of antiquity. One of the things that when you start saying things like, well, the Bible is kind of saying, well, don't question it. Dude, read the scriptures. You know, y'all y'all are the first people that would say asinine things like, oh, well, we just want to jump out on blind faith. Dude, the Bible doesn't say we perish for lack of faith. It says we perish for lack of knowledge. It says in all thine getting and understanding. Information and knowledge is one of the key things. Matter of fact, even in Hebrew, it says, let's move beyond the elementary teachings of our faith. So this is a this is a knowledge faith worldview based on scholarship. So this idea that you're trying to imply that this is some type of evil propaganda type of, oh, well, don't just do what I say. Bro, read the scripture. Just read the text, bro. Okay, well, let, let, I'm not let, here let, to convince you. Every question I'm not here to convince you about, about any religion. I just wanted to know, what's your stance? What's your belief? I said I'm, I'm a former Christian. I'm an atheist agnostic, depending on how you define it. But uh, yeah, so so let's provide some context. So you know, Jesus said this about you know hating family members, but that's not how he treated his family members, right? Well, right. we find a story in Mark. You know, remember when Jesus is uh, sitting and uh, people are upset, and his family, you know, his mother and brothers come to get him, and they think he's out of his mind, and he's you know, and somebody tells him, you know, your mother and brothers are here. He's like. Uh, no, you know, my, my, my mother and brothers are the, one who, the ones listening to me. Those, those people are not what, my mother what, what, does, what does hate mean? Define hate. Let, let's, let's work through this, bro. I, let me help you out. What, what does hate, define hate? Define hate. Just give me a definition of hate. If I hate, if I hate chocolate cake, if I hate a person, if I hate anything, define hate in its proper context. Put it in its proper context. That is the key. In this, in this particular context, and Albie is correct. It is what it is. Let's not get it twisted. Let's not try to make the word soften. No, it is what it is. But it also means to set aside, to reject, or to discount. So don't just look at it as this, this evil term. We use this term all the time. But make sure you're using it in its proper context. It's also relative. It's like if your mama tell you to do something and God tell you which one you're going to do. Albie, well, no, you use, I, I, ta I taught you that, that, that uh, precept, well, Albie. Constantin, can you reconcile these <laughs> oh, two so things? Yeah, Constantin, can, can you reconcile this with us? So, you know, your verse about Jesus says, hate everyone. Um, and then with the commandment, which Jesus also call, uh, followed and fulfilled and supports, which is, you know, honor your father and mother so your days will be long. So um, can you, in your former Christian atheistic um, in, interpretation, reconcile those two? 
and the Bible completely contradicts itself and totally lies and no one figured it out in thousands of years is a fine answer if that's where you want to go. But so when Jesus says hate, um, and then also he follows the commandments that say honor, what do you think about those two? How do you reconcile those? Nate, you... Nate, before, Nate, before he gives an answer, w would you be able to read the compare the a parallel account? Because like I told you, in Luke 14, 26, yeah. and right now I'm driving, so I can't pull it, pull it up, but all he's saying is your love for me should be as such that your love for your parents would look as though you hate them <clears throat> when in comparison. So God's hatred is comparative, preferring one over another. Like Esau, uh, I hated Jacob, I loved. It's simply comparative. No more, no less. Uh, even thinking, even the wife of your youth in Deuteronomy 21, 15. What do you want me to read, Albert? Matthew 10, 37, but really Matthew 10, I believe the context begins in 34. And then 37 to 39 should be uh, this answer. But here's what Christ came to bring. And since he resurrected, I'll take Christ over, uh, you know, Constantine over here. Humanism. So, okay. Yeah, I'll read this real quick. Um, okay. So Matthew 10, 34. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father and daughter against her mother and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. As if that doesn't happen naturally. Um, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves mother and father more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I mean, that that is absolutely an answer. So then you just have to think, okay, did people overlook this little nugget of gold? Um, for thousands of years and did his own disciples never talk to each other about this stuff and they wrote wildly different things or this is easily reconcilable just like the honor your father and mother thing um you know i'm willing to say that people have not been this dense for two thousand years and his disciples probably had many conversations together obviously um so yeah hate does not mean i hate you mommy you ruined my life get away from me um hate doesn't mean that it's by comparison and then you're like, well, you're just using interpretive language. How do you get that? Well, Matthew 10, 34 through 39. Um, would you like to respond, Constantine? Uh, I mean, sure. What what specifically would you like me to respond <clears throat> to? Um, I, I, so, I would, yeah. hey, hey, Nate, well, I would he, like him to respond when he talks, when he mentioned that uh, biblically. Uh, well, well hang on, hang on. I said, it, I, I said it first. So I want you to respond to your, your thing about the hate. Reconcile that with the honor your father and mother and reconcile what I just read with, you must love yourself more, uh, you know, than love Jesus more than you love yourself and parents and all this. So I just want you to respond by reconciling those together. Yeah. I mean, like, I, otherwise I think, hate can't I, I mean think, what you mean by hate. Yeah, go ahead. I think it's pretty straightforward. I think Jesus is uh, saying, you know, if you take all of those uh, verses together, what he's saying is sure, love your father and mother. But if you, if there is a choice, between you know your father and mother and the kingdom of God, you choose the kingdom of God and you hate your father and mother. I mean that's 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 pretty obvious. And you know I would assume uh, that you know I don't know if Jesus said this. I, I would assume not. You know, but uh, you know the gospels are written 50 years later. Christians are you know being persecuted. They're they're a small minority. They feel isolated. They feel you know, denigrated by the society. And so they're writing these words of Jesus to kind of explain. I mean, how do we deal with like family relations? So we have I have a pagan mother and father, and uh, you know, but I believe in Jesus. So what do I do? And uh, and basically what what they're saying is like stick with the church. You know, stick with us, with your Christian community, and not with your family. You know, and uh, and they're using very strong language, basically, to say, you know, hate your pagan family, you know, or Jewish family, who whoever doesn't agree with you and uh, is a stumbling block in your faith, like hate them, you know, uh, kind of reject them, you know, and that kind of thing. And uh, I, I just think it's, it's dangerous. I mean, if you apply that logic to anything, you know, I, I understand you accept Christianity, you accept the claims of Jesus, so it seems reasonable because, sure, you know, your eternal life is, uh, and the, the truth is more important than your family or in, even your own life, 
But if you apply it to anything else, I mean, as soon as, you know, if it's talking about Muhammad, if it's talking about Joseph Smith or some other, you know, cult leader, you, you understand right away that this is very dangerous, uh, divisive language. I mean, uh, so, so there is a clear bias here. And I understand your bias, but, you know, I just don't agree with it. Well, I mean, don't forget there's also the part that talks about, you know, who are we to judge the world and stuff like that. So, I mean, really, it, it's not a cop-out to say if you want to have a bone, if you want to pick a bone with Christianity, like, arguing with Christians 101 is really read their book. And, and I mean, you know, I mean, I've, you know, I'm sure the people who have read the Bible have read it more than once. Um, it doesn't mean we automatically remember everything in it. But the more we read it, especially if you want the cause of fighting against Christianity in the Bible— the more you read it and the well, more verse you are with it, the better it goes because things will – you'll be able to easily recall stuff. So we won't just have to go on interpretations and what we think we remember. We can like you know Google stuff to be like, I think I remember this, like what I just did, right? Like I think I remember the Bible said this. Let me see if I'm right, and then you can bring it up. So we use the entire Bible to, to reconcile the totality of Scripture for our answers and for our views. So if you just take a couple things, like if the only thing you read about the Bible is the hate thing, yeah, sounds pretty bad. Sounds like you could justify a lot of crusades and inquisitions with that. But if you read the totality of scripture, it becomes harder to do that and harder to have the interpretation of hate that you mean because you know we're also told like what what business do we have judging people outside the world? God will be their judge. So instead of like, you know, doing some some bad thing or treating them like hatefully or unkind, um know that the Bible also says God is their judge, so you don't judge them. Your job, a great commission in Matthew, is to tell people about this hope in, well, hope in Christ, that's Second Peter, but is to tell them about Jesus and how to have eternal life. And if they want to be to learn more, then stay and you know offer discipleship and tell them about it. Um, and if they don't, shake the dust from your feet. So if you say, well, they should hate people and that's dangerous, but then you say, well, what what does hate mean? It's by comparison, and whoever doesn't, you know, hate them by comparison to Christ, like Matthew 10, we just read. Um, and then you reconcile that with, well, how should I treat them? I should I should let, want them to be in Christ. So here's Jesus. There's eternal life. Do you want this? Yes. Great. Everyone loves kum, loves everyone. Kumbaya. If they don't, if this is one of the people that, you know, you should be, quote, hating um, and they don't want anything to do with you or your God, um, like you perhaps, well, then our job is to leave their judgment between to God and it's between them and God. We shake the dust from our feet. So just like I'm treating you, Constantine, if you take the totality of Scripture, um, it should go something like this. So how do I how do I hate Constantine? It's like, well, um, you know, Jesus died for you. He is God. He rose from the dead. Repent. Believe that. Pray to him. Ask to be born again. Receive eternal life. Would you like to do that? Uh, no, I would not. Are you sure? Yes, I am sure. Um, your God is a lie. OK, well, then, you know, you're free to do what you want. I think you should reconsider. Um, now let's talk about something else and be cordial. That's about how, quote, hate in the Bible should go. Um, so, yeah, that's what I got. I mean, I, and I come to that conclusion not because I'm, you know, like a liberal kumbaya peace and love person. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, geared the opposite. But, I mean, if I'm being true to the totality of the Bible, that's how I – that's the result. So that's how I hate you, Constantine, um, actually by loving you and not hating you at all. <laughs> Yeah, I would just add like one more piece of context. I remember the story when, uh, you know, uh, a man wants to follow Jesus, but his father just died and he died. And he says, you know, can I, you know, uh, you know, bury my father and then follow you? And Jesus says, let the, let the dead bury the dead. So it's kind of the same idea. Like, what's, what's the difference if this guy, you know, his, his dad just died? I mean, don't you have compassion? Can't you like uh, give him an extra day to bury his father instead of like demanding that he, you know, uh, drop everything and follow you? I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of insane, don't you think? It is, but this is where, like we talked, I think, before you got here, if, you don't, if you're not 100% positive you have all the information, it would be a great idea, um, practically speaking, to withhold judgment rather than make a decision against the Bible or even for it. I mean, of course, I'll say make a decision for the Bible, but if we're being honest, if you don't, if you're not convinced you have all the information you can get, withhold judgment because what if jesus said that and they're like wow jesus you sound harsh you could have said that nicer maybe he'd be like yeah i could have said it nicer but i knew there, there was going to be an earthquake and a building would have fell on him if he would have stayed so you know i could have said it nicer maybe to make your feels better uh but this is exercising faith if i say the dead will take care of themselves uh so come follow me by doing that i actually prevented an earthquake from having a building collapse on him as unlikely as that scenario seems i mean we can't prove or disprove it, but the point is we don't know the mind of God. We don't know what was going through Jesus' mind when he said that. 
So if you're saying it's bad and heartless and callous, it could just as easily have been compassionate that would lead to the saving of his eternal soul. Um, so since we don't absolutely know one way or the other what was going through his head, we should just not automatically default to the worst case scenario and be like, you know what? That's fair. I'll withhold judgment. Um, that sounds reasonable, right? I'm not crazy. Yeah, although we know exactly what was going through his head. So in, in Luke chapter 9, verse 60, where he says, let the dead bury their own dead rather than going and burying the dead, right? That no longer have a name. Follow me and you'll receive eternal life. Except this guy, he doesn't believe Constantine. So he's trying to, uh, he's, he's trying to uh, find a problem with everything that Jesus says, not believing, uh, not knowing who Jesus is. Well, that's his problem. But the fact that he resurrected from the grave solidifies his claims and who he is. Therefore, I promise you this, your knee will bow too, Constantine. Yeah, what Alvi said is 100% correct. When you read that text, uh, it, matter of fact, two other scriptures can can help you get a better understanding of that. It's Romans Romans 7 and Romans 6. And basically, what, 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 what as, as uh, Alvi was explaining, we're no longer under uh, sin. Uh, we, we're not dead to sin. We're not dead to the law. Uh, we're free from that. And, and Alvi expressed it perfectly. You know, you, you have a choice now. You can remain under this system and allow those that are under this system to do what, the, what the, the, to do the things of the system, which is to bury the dead, or you can now move forward into eternal salvation, into eternal life. So, so these things need to be put in proper context. And by, we don't know what was going through Jesus' head, sorry. I, I meant like external stuff that's not in the Bible, like, I don't know, a lightning storm, rain's coming. Uh, right. Just superfluous sur stuff that doesn't really matter. That but, was Nate, the point. but Nate, but think about what you just mentioned about lightning storm. You know, <clears throat> one of the things Constantine tried to imply is that uh, Jesus does not appear to be as gracious with people outside of his family. Well, what, he seemed to be pretty gracious to the young lady that they wanted to stone. He seemed to be pretty gracious when he's with the disciples and they say, hey, do we need to cast fire from the heaven and kill these people and he said no that's not what i came to do so to imply that jesus is somehow being impartial or, or expresses some type of partiality towards people that only uh uh are living this quote-unquote perfect life or however he's trying to explain it that's the furthest thing from the truth rick you do understand. i mean i'd also say it's pretty well, well, um, well hang on. yeah rick, I, I mean i also say it's pretty gracious that you know the bible says you know while we were all enemies of christ he still died for us that's pretty gracious right. go ahead constantine get right get the final word and then we'll talk to some of the other people that came up go yeah ahead, yeah great i think we exhausted the subject but uh, just to let rico know uh, since you brought up the uh, the story of the woman who was about to be stoned you do realize that's not on the earliest man manuscripts it's a it's a made-up story it's not on the bible you do realize that Oh, well, I did say last, last word. Uh, actually, I actually, it is in the Bible. So, so you haven't, you haven't again studied the uh, transmission, right? It's not in our earliest copies. Nevertheless, the story is in there. It's quoted by our church father. So, before you open up your mouth and start speaking in your ignorance or receive a phone call like a dummy and run away, stop making claims about the Bible, or you'll be put in your place. Yeah, what he's saying is so untrue. It's, it's such well, yeah. ignorance that he just. <clears throat> And Nate, Sorry, I'm like, uh, if you don't mind. I couldn't hit the. Uh, hang on. I couldn't He's hit the back. Microphone. So you got to hear me cough. Well, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, even if it's not in, like I agree with what you say, but let's just say worst case scenario, because if we knock out the worst case scenario, everything to everything else is dominoes. So worst case scenario, it's not in the earliest manuscripts yet. It found its way in the Bible. Great. You know, is it John who says like all the miracles of Jesus alone, all the stuff Jesus did, forgetting everything else? You know, there's not enough pages in the world to contain it. Which you could say it's metaphorical, but technically, if Jesus really created every single molecule, then that's like a another page of stuff he's done. So um, there, there literally would not be enough paper um, in the earth, in the universe, to contain all the works Jesus did. So can you imagine how many stories um, are left out of the Bible that happened during the times of Jesus? And if someone's like, you know, added those to the Bible in like the third or fourth or fifth century— it doesn't mean it's not true because it was in the earliest manuscripts. It just means it's one more story, um, you know, among like probably countless stories um, that wasn't included in the earliest writings, but they're still true. Um, anyways, just just to say that. Um, not saying people can't make up stuff, but anyway. Uh, yeah, son, I want to get to you, but there are some other people first uh, that have been patiently waiting. Uh, Tyrell, you were next. What's up, Tyrell? Hey, good morning, everybody. I just had a question. Um to uh, better understand uh, help my faith um, was 
Mary, uh, still the pure, the, the perpetual virgin, uh, after Jesus was born, or did she have no. children? She had kids. She had kids. Yep. Is there any verse that, uh, you can give me that will back that up? Uh, yeah. Uh, the ones that talk about Jesus's, <clears throat> Jesus's, uh, what, half-brother? Was it, was it James? Jesus' half-brother? Yeah, yeah give me a second, I'll get the reference. Yeah, his brother was James, yeah. Yeah, that was, and so, I mean, the only, brother. go ahead. Like his, like his, like his blood brother, right? Yeah, half brother because James was not immaculately conceived by the Holy Spirit. So half brother, yes. Oh, okay, okay, I understand. Okay, thank you guys. And I mean, it makes reference to you know Jesus' brothers and sisters too, right? Like, like the Bible, Bible says that like the only pushback you're going to find, I mean, other than someone saying it's all fairy tales, it doesn't exist, it's all it's all made up, um, would be like <clears throat> the Catholic teaching because for some reason they they need to preserve their worship of Mary. So they need her to be a perpetual version. So whenever it says like Jesus's brothers and sisters um, and identifies like James as his half brother, though, they try to kind of say that that's um, that's his cousin because like half brother actually means um, cousin somehow. And then they have their weird way to, to do that. Um, but I'm convinced it's just so they can make Mary, um, you know, the queen of heaven and pray to her. And that's that's something that helps him justify that. But as far as just a plain reading of scripture, <laughs> shout out, Michael. Um, yeah, Jesus clearly has brothers. Yeah. So <clears throat> some theologians actually also believe if this will also help you, Tyrell. But this is something that I would encourage you to study more in depthly. Uh, that Jude, who also wrote Jude, is also a brother. Um, the reason why some believe that is uh, I believe in the scripture it says um, Jude, the servant of Christ and the brother of James. And what they're saying is. They're, they're, they're studying to see if indeed is he talking about Jesus' brother, James, uh, and is this the same because they, it was implied that Jesus also had a brother also named Jude. Now, some also interpret that as Judas. Now, not the same Judas, because yeah, because remember, just like you so today, you got a zillion people named Michael, a zillion people named Larry, whatever. There are people that share the same name, but they're completely different people, Simon, et cetera, et cetera. So, so if you study deeply, you'll find out that this, it is believed that I think he has at least up to three brothers. But definitely do, do, just do your due diligence, do your study, and, and I, think, I think you'll come up with some, some good answers. I appreciate it, brother. Uh, Thank you all so much. Yeah, yeah no uh, Nate, can I, just, can I just ask Nate one question? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not Catholic myself, but uh, I just want to do justice to the topic a little bit. Um, because before you mentioned when Contestine brought up the verse about hate and stuff like that, and you mentioned... Oh, so all of those guys who read the Bible and stuff like that, they didn't, they didn't think of that and stuff like that. I want to ask you the same question about this topic because uh, are there any, so f for like the first 500, 600 years or however the, you know, church fathers there was, can you quote any who took the brethren of the Lord as being actual uh, brothers, uh, sorry, actual children from Mary rather than like, uh, like uh, children from Joseph's previous marriage or his cousins and stuff like that? Is, is there any? Because if you can't show it, then you're being inconsistent. Uh, so, okay. So if I can't, if I can't show you, I, I want to say, to answer your question, uh, no, I can't because I don't know everything every church father ever, ever said or believed about this topic. Um, so maybe I could research it for you, but I mean, that's a lot of stuff to go through. Um, but you said I would be inconsistent. So um, other than saying, I don't know, I'll have to get back to you because I don't know everything church fathers said or believed. Um, what am I being inconsistent about? Uh, well, because if you're, if uh, when it comes to Constantine asking about hating and stuff like that, and then you're bringing up, well, so everyone, everyone who read, uh, you know, who's been reading the Bible since since it began, hasn't hasn't thought of, uh, you know, hate your father or mother or the parallel Matthew ten thirty seven. They haven't read it. It just it just crossed their mind. Well, uh, if 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 that if that sort of reasoning applies to hate your father or mother, why can it not can it not apply to the brethren of the Lord, where? Uh, Christians, theologians that have, have greater minds than we ever will, that were martyrs for the faith si since the beginning, when when they read in Greek, which was their mother tongue, how come they didn't come to the conclusions like, uh, oh, that means that those were children from Mary? Because uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, that's why I, I asked you if you, can, if you can quote any church father that actually taught Mary had children. So you I... would be inconsistent if you couldn't. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Um, I think 
again, since I don't know everything every church father ever said about this topic, um, I, I just don't have an answer. So I mean, that that would say I'm, I mean, that would at least kick the inconsistency down because I just don't have an answer. But what would resolve the Nate's not inconsistent thing is with the hate your father and brother. We immediately went to scripture to text proof that. So that would be how Nate is not inconsistent. Because whenever it says hate your brother and father, how do I get the interpretation that hate doesn't mean, you know, like beat them with bats and, and like and with great animus, I hate them. Well, we answered that with scripture from the honor your father and mother in, in Levitical law and Matthew 10. So we directly answered scripture with scripture, not so much our, you know, off the wall, off the cuff interpretation. We just read the scripture and reconciled it together, just like the Bereans did, I dare say. Um, so then when we're talking about this interpretation with the church fathers, um, I would say the question of whether or not we're inconsistent um, is is not the right thing to say because we just we just don't know. So unless we're putting church fathers' writings that I'm unaware of on par with Scripture, which some Catholics may, but I certainly would not, um, that you'd have to reconcile what they say with Scripture. And I will just say that no, um, Scripture is higher than any writing of any church father especially someone who doesn't put stock in what church fathers have to say. Um, if they do stuff, if the church fathers say stuff, say stuff that I, that, you know, Protestants agree with, like, you know, Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is God. Jesus rose from the dead. Well, great. That means I agree with the church father, not because I take the authority of the church father, but because the church father is saying something directly out of the word of God, like the, the apostles creed and the Nicene creed and the Athanasian creed. Like I agree with all these creed. Uh, creeds. It doesn't mean I'm Catholic. It doesn't mean I take their authority and tradition. It just means I agree with them because they're saying exactly what the Bible says. Um, and then if they talk about other stuff, like, you know, church fathers that dip their toes into heresy, um, who had incomplete scriptures and they didn't even have what became the full Bible. Well, no, I'll disagree with church fathers all day because uh, I know there's plenty of heretical stuff they said uh, and some recanted and some didn't. Um, yeah, that's what I'd say, but I, I don't think we could get to we're uh, being inconsistent. Um, because yeah, on one we use scripture to talk about scripture, and on the other one, we're talking about comparing scripture with tradition of church fathers, who I am not even close to Catholic. Uh, does yeah, that yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, the only thing I would say is uh, I wasn't saying like you must believe everything the church fathers say, but the only reason why, obviously, interpreting scripture with with scripture is the first thing anyone should do. But the fact that you brought up uh, historic interpretations of the scriptures or historic understanding when it comes to hate your father or mother, that should also apply to 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 everything else. Uh, so that you not so that you're not inconsistent. Why would you apply it for this one but but not for this one? Uh, you know that's that's pretty much all I was bringing up. But yeah, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Sure. If we're talking about the Bible, then sure, let's do that. Um, if we're if we're talking about historical stuff coming from uh, what is not biblical stuff like what is you know from church fathers or other stuff i i'd say no but if we're, if we're talking about scripture and scripture yes if we're talking about you know scripture and just other humans who are not um you know under the inspiration of the holy spirit then no um so i, I think we're close enough to the same page there uh serendipity what's up if you're speaking uh, good morning May. hey yeah i'm just listening Welcome to the fires <laughs> clubhouse. <laughs> uh, Rico, do you have anything on your mind or are you just here to talk about whatever topic comes about? Yeah, just chilling, bro. Just, I'm good. Thank you, bro. How about you, Mr. Doctor? Three, two, one, out of the box. What's up? Yo, hello, hello, how are you? Okay. How about yourself? Um, I'm okay. So, uh, do you guys love your enemies? I mean, I try to. It gets hard sometimes. Well, so you love your enemies? Sure. Let me just define that real quick. I know we've talked. I don't remember what position you're coming from, but it, it doesn't matter. Um, when, when we say love our enemies, like, you know, I'm of the conviction that love is a verb. It's an action. So it's not like some euphorical sense, like, I love you so much, enemy who wants to kill me. Here's a flower. Here's some roses. Um, love is an is a action. So if someone, like, hates me to death, and they're like, I hate you. Um, I don't want anything to do with you. I will spit on your coffin. Um, I'll be like, well, that doesn't make me feel good. Yet, if that same person, uh, you know, broke down on my driveway, I don't know, 
that'd be weird. Uh, let's say broke down the ro- <laughs> broke down a couple houses away from me as they were just driving by. Um, then love my enemy would be like, I know this person hates me and doesn't want anything to do with me. Said they're going to spit on my grave, but they have a flat. So what can I do to love my enemy? I'll go help them change a flat or at least I'll call trip away for them. So that would be what I mean by love my enemies. It doesn't mean capitulate. It doesn't mean like bow down to them. It doesn't mean let them like do terrible things to you. Um, it means that. So if they're like, you know, dying somewhere along the road, like the good Samaritan, you know, give them a cup of water, call someone to help them, take them to a hospital. That's what love your enemies All means. Right, so, and pray for them. So is there a, like hierarchy of love? What's that? Is there a hierarchy of love? So do you love like, for example, your children more than you love your enemies or do you love everyone the same? You know, if someone else wants to biblically speak to that, I would say, um, you know, with, without me like citing any any verse, um, pulling a verse out of the hat, I'll say, of course, uh, you know, love the Lord God uh, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So God is first. Without God, loving your children, your pets, your enemies, any of that is it's just nonsensical. Because if you love them but don't love God, you're loving something that you know philosophically or, or actually literally would not exist. So if you don't love God first and most and recognize your creator, then what good is it to like have some vapid, uh, auspicious form, is auspicious the right word? Some vapid, ethereal type of love towards someone. So first, you must love God. Without God, nothing else you think you That's love would question. even exist. That's not my but, 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 you said there's a hierarchy. Wait, wait, hang on. You said there's a hierarchy. The hierarchy is, without getting biblical, God, and then I love my family. And then if I half, like, you know, gun to head, I love my spouse more than my kids. A lot of people mess it up, and they're like, I love my kids more than my spouse. Great. That's the prescription for divorce. That's for the prescription for unbiblical union. So God, spouse, kids, and then, you know, somewhere you, down there is it. So are you basically saying, you know, uh, God over man, man over woman? Are you just basically saying that? I'm not talking about man over woman. I'm talking about God over everything else. Yes. Yeah, but that's, in the, that's like in the Bible. So like God over man, man over woman, woman over children. If you're a man and your spouse is a wife, then yes. If you're a wife and your spouse is a husband, then she would say, well, uh, it's not a sex thing, right? It's a spouse thing. The two shall become one. So, like, how can you love your kid, you know, more than more than you love part of yourself? Again, it's back to God. If God doesn't exist for you to love, your wife doesn't exist. Your kids don't exist. If your wife, who you've spiritually become one with, doesn't exist, you can't love your kids because without your wife, who is a part of yourself now, you, that your kids don't exist. So, yes, God, spouse. So if you're a man and you're married to a woman, you're a spouse. If you're a woman and you're married to a man, you're a spouse. It's not a male and female thing. It's a spouse thing. So, Nate, do you, do you love the devil? I'm going to say no. But in in uh, Peter 5, 1 Peter 5, 8, it says that the devil is your enemy. I mean, sounds very similar to what I just said. So, yeah, the... So, but, but what, Nate, what? let me add this. One, he's first of all, he's being artful. But, but one of the things he also has to understand too, biblically speaking, the word love is not a universal monolithic term. We have in this scripture, we have Pelia, Eros, Storge, Agape. So, you, when you ask that question, "Do I love my enemy?" I can say yes, but I can also uh, e- express it in a way where yes, I don't want to cause harm upon him. I love him in, in terms of. Uh, yes, we may not agree on things. He may not be operating within the will of God, but I also know how to differentiate what type of love that is. So he, he's just being artful right now. I'm, 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 I'm just, wait, 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 hang on, out on. Yeah, out, hang, hang on one second. Wait, 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 one second. It, it, let me just try to fast walk this and see if I'm on the conclusion. So besides I just said, no, I don't really, you know, love the devil um, and the devil's your enemy. Yeah, sounds good. But also Jesus says, you know, love, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So if people are doing bad to you, I'll pray for them. So if we're saying, you know, I love my enemies, I'll give my worst enemy a glass of water to keep him, you know, hydrated and stuff like that. But if my enemy is like, hey, I'm going to kill you and your whole family. Well, I'll, you know, defend myself. And if my enemy, you know, expires during the process of me defending myself, it doesn't mean I hate him. It means I'm going to do what I need to do to keep me and mine safe. So if we're trying to get to, well, you're, the devil's your enemy, therefore you should love freaking Satan, um, we could say that um, this way. Um, if, if that's where we're going, and you're saying I should love the devil, um, the ultimate evil in the universe, um, sure, I can play, I can get in that sandbox as far as saying um, if the devil, Satan, incarnated himself in my driveway and ring my doorbell and is like, I want to destroy your eternal soul and suck your uh, face into hell with me forever, 
but uh, do you have a cup of water? I'll be like, uh, well, you know, Jesus help, uh, you know, probably doing a lot of rebuking and stuff like that and praying. So, but um, perhaps, perhaps I would hand the devil a cup of water and be like, here's water. I rebuke in the name of Jesus. Stay away from me. Um, so if we're saying we should love the devil, that's about as far down that road as I can go. But the devil's also a spiritual entity. So to say that spiritual entities are the same level as your fellow human, I would say that's uh, completely erroneous and off the mark and not what the Bible's talking about. Oh, yeah. Why do you want to play that game? Hey, Nate. Throw the devil know, like, in the water. I, I, could, I could hope and pray and wish that someone would become a follower of Christ and stop being an evil, wicked person and turn over a new leaf and repent. I mean, yeah, I'd love to see you know satan stop being who he is can we get a definition of love before, please before we carry on i mean there's a uh, in, in, well, well, ta- in what hey, context hey, yeah the, there's well, hey, wait, wait. hey so we, i we, i do have a question we, as well i have yeah, a question on, for out of well hang on one second i wanted to move on because you just got a definition right there's like the five different loves there's agape philo eros like the, there's like the romantic love the agape love and, and uh, the brotherly love. So you kind of got a definition. But before we continue down this, I mean, you know, we've already gone as far as to, you know, we're loving Satan and throwing some water at him to help the guy out because he doesn't have a good future. So, I mean, we've gone pretty ludicrous. I just want to check in with uh, Steph real fast before we continue this um, very interesting path. Oh, are no, no, Steph? carry on. This is fantastic. I mean, you are suffering <clears throat> in the extreme right now, and I am I'm, I'm enjoying watching <laughs> Steph, would you give Satan a cup of uh, water if he asked for it? No, yeah, he wants as you were answering your soul. that question, I was wondering, and I, I don't think I would. <laughs> okay. Um, well, logical. Uh, what's up? Do you have a question before we continue this madness? Uh, no, it's all right. Like, I, I want to just... Uh, let's go. All right, Albie, you had a question for Alda. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I have a question for him. So, I'm, out of curiosity... While Romans 5.12 says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5.8-12, out of curiosity, does Allah love us first, or do we have to first love Allah, and then he's going to love us? Why are you does running Allah... to Why are we doing Muslim stuff, man? Yeah, why are you coming to Islam? You're speaking about the Bible. Hmm? Well, no, I, I'm, I'm curious. Can you show me? Uh, me, me, wh- me, why are you interrupting me? Because I'll please, be why are you interrupting. Because you're Can you move me down, please? Because she's going to keep interrupting for some reason. I'm not going to keep, but you're instigating. Okay, and don't somebody interrupt should call me, you out on it. Don't somebody should call me, you me. out. Can somebody you're instigating. Her. We was talking yeah, about oh, that. Yeah, for the record, is like, I, here? Because I even, he invited me. What the, what, yeah. What's the problem, Steph? You always have even, a problem. Okay, when hang you on, call hang yourself hang a Christian. You always coming at me. For real, I don't bother you. I don't talk to you. I don't. Oh, oh goodness! I couldn't. So I couldn't. Much. I couldn't find the drop button fast enough. Goodness! Yeah, me. I invited you, and I. I know. I, I think we talked before. I don't know you enough to. Uh, to know whatever Steph has an issue with. But yeah, on one hand, look, it, it's ask a Christian. You know, I. I want to like you know take all the fire and you know redirect it and turn it around and answer from a Christian perspective. I don't necessarily care about other people's religions, uh, but you know, I mean, since you've got the Christian to admit, we're going to give you know your gin a cup of water. So, um, you know, as much as I like to field questions and not really go on the offensive, um, you know, occasionally I'm fine with it. So, I mean, if Albie wants to do that, I mean, unless we're going to keep saying how we should, like, I don't know, end up, like, offering Satan some flowers and to, to be his bride. I, I mean, I don't know how far we can go. So, I mean, since there's nowhere else to go. Yeah, I mean, Albie, if you want to ask the guy a question about Islam, I mean, I'm fine with it. I'd yeah. rather not take, like, an hour doing so. But, yeah, go and, ahead. Nate, and, Nate, normally I wouldn't ask, but because the questions are uh, insincere. So let's turn it around right on right back at him and show the inconsistency and the incoherency of following uh, this dumb pagan God. But uh, but to be fair, Nate, to be fair to Alby, uh, thank, thankfully, the replay is on when Alda asked the question, he started out asking in in contrast to the Muslim faith. Thankfully, the replay is on. When we go what back, what do you mean by it. that? What do you mean by that? In contrast, in contrast no, you, you, that. when you asked the question about love, you were actually in reference. You, you actually brought up in contrast to, to, to the Muslim faith. No, I didn't. You, you brought that. It's on the re- look. It's on the replay. Look, I don't have to. It's on the replay. You, you mentioned that. So, so when Albie brought it up, now I'm not, I'm not, I'm not insinuating that that's why he mentioned it, but I feel as though he was fair to mention it because you, br- you brought that into the equation. 
Just check the replay, bro. Yeah. You can put the smiley face up all you want. Check the replay. Uh, yeah, did you ask your question yet or not, Albie? I was doing some other stuff. Uh, Albie, did you ask your question yet? Yeah, so my question is this. Does Do we have to first love Allah, or does Allah love us first? Okay, so when you are first born, uh, you, you're by default a Muslim. So if you mean when you're born, yes, Allah loves all his newborns, all the children, yes. Oh, okay. So I'm asking, do we first have to love Allah, or does Allah only love those who first love him? Allah only loves those who love him. So Allah only loves those who first love him. So you have to first love Allah, and then Allah will love you, right? Yeah, but by default, when you're born, you love Allah because it's a natural inclination. So then Allah loves all his newborns. How, Allah can, you, loves how can you love How can you love anybody when you're a newborn? What are you talking about? Because children have a natural inclination and babies have a natural inclination of believing in God and submitting to God. Yeah, so that wasn't my question. So my question was this. Us, those who can discern their left hand from their right. And, and then also, you said already, you first have to love Allah and then Allah will love you. Okay, right? yeah, Just, what, what, what's wrong with that? Okay, no problem. That's one. Number two, the no, greatest relationship, you, the greatest relationship you can have with Allah, the greatest relationship you can have with Allah is slave to master. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. We are slaves to Allah here. Yeah. So that's the greatest relationship you can ever have to Allah is slave to master, oh, right? Of course, yes. Okay, thank you very much, man. Hey, so Does Jesus love me? Does Michael, Jesus you about ready to bust out of here, Michael? No, Does what Jesus... I was asking was, listen, there was a lot of talk going on earlier. So, Nate, I've heard you say a million times, you, you know, that there there are cookies and stuff. But there, there was also another comment made about cookies. And I just need to know, like, because this is not, this is not a, a, a small question. First of all, are they chocolate chip or chocolate chunk? Because it matters. Um, and how many do I get? That's how involved it is. I am. To Islam or Christianity? Well, come on, put it on the table, man. I'm an atheist. Either side can have me if the cookies are good enough. Uh, well, I mean, you know, if I can, I mean, if I can buy your soul for the kingdom of heaven, um, I'll say, you know, you give me your preference, and I'll run to the store and you know grab you. Any, you got you got about a hard budget of twenty bucks um, to save your soul. <laughs> hey, so, Nate, um, you know how these you love how these atheists love attacking Christianity, but don't want to like touch us. Well, Michael, I don't want to get you. You know, <laughs> I don't want to get you. Um, Turned into turned into different Michaels and multiple pieces of Michael. Yeah, um, so, yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ask you to. I'm not gonna ask yeah. you to test test anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You this know, is... If you ask any question to Muslims, you will die straight away. This is this is a fact. Yeah, this is this is preposterous. Um, uh, so I, as I said earlier, before before um, before Mr. Uh, wristwatch showed up, um, the Bashran Constantine, the oldest watch in the world. I was I was asked what I thought about Islam and I, or no, I was asked about what I thought about Muhammad and I said he was an uh, Ill, um, illiterate epileptic and that he totally didn't ride to heaven on a horse. Um, Islam is ridiculously was stupid. Was you there? Islam is ridiculously Michael, stupid Michael, Michael, and I think it's just there? as made up as Christianity. How about that, doctor? Yeah, I mean, you'll say that occasionally, but 99% of the time you'll stick on Christianity. Yeah, Nate, remember well, what I was saying before about why I don't interact with some people? Michael, I was asking you a minute ago, are you ready to bust out of here? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, who's sending a link, you or me? Uh, I will send a... You, you know what? Uh, join me I in don't... a private clubhouse room so uh, so I, I can set this up and you're not just waiting and thinking I'm a lying Christian or something. So anyways, yeah, I think we've... Uh, how long has this been? It seems like years. Oh, yeah, Albie, you want to keep this thing going or, or you're fishing? Does anyone... I don't know, Steph, I'm not even going to ask. I know you're like, I'm busy. I'm taking my kids to the grandma. Oh, I know. Oh, I'm, I'm driving home now. Do you want to Do you wanna keep this thing going, Albie? No pressure? I could mod oh, with so Albie. I just can't mod alone because I'm not fully attentive. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> Steph needs a, man to, yeah. needs a man to help her function. Um, Correct, she's just yes. a woman. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, I mean, I, I get that you'll you'll probably go along with that because you have humor, but you know, in case in case people don't, the official position of Ask a Christian is Steph does not need a man to function. Um, I oh, mean, that's yeah, awesome. Jesus, that's sure. 
I mean, anything else is her personal that she's admitting, but the Christian position is, you know, oh, whatever. I'm out of here. <laughs> All right, guys, have fun. Bye, Nate. Uh, yeah, Michael. Michael is is the uh, going to be the first person to help me on my technical thing. I, I wanted to do more like podcast stuff, like with uh, with people on actual, you know, video cameras and, and things like that. So uh, Michael is gracious enough to uh, gracious enough to oblige. So if anyone else would like to to do that too, and like you know, get their pretty mug on a on a camera sometime and have uh, some discussions similar to this, let me know. But that's where that's where we're off to. So uh, if you guys want to see whatever nonsense we get into, uh, you can find it on YouTube or Rumble or Bitshoot. <laughs> All right, man. Take it easy, bro.